We are live now, ma'am. We ask Alka to start, or you are starting. Uh, she'll start now. Uh, so uh, I welcome uh, one and all for our journal club. So we have been conducting our journal club every second Tuesday. So this will be the month July uh, July twenty twenty three's journal club. Uh, Alka, can we have our next slide, please? Ah yes, ma'am. Ma'am, my slide is not moving. I think. Yes, it's not moving for us. One minute, ma'am. Please click on the slide one so that you can move, ma'am. Click on the slide and then you move the down button. Yes, yes. now you can. Yes, the next one. I'll come. Okay, so it is my great privilege to welcome Dr. Alka Nadar. Madam is an assistant professor from SRMC, uh, the Srihar Medical Institute. And she's a UG PG teacher and she's done her UG from Maharashtra and PG from Vijaya with seven years of obstetrics and gynec experience with the field of interest in endoscopy. And she's been an active person and she's one of my committee member. And uh, I will hand it over to Alka for the further proceedings. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind introduction, ma'am. Um, I welcome everyone for a journal club uh, uh, act, uh, done by Oxy uh, for the month of July 2023. And uh, before we move ahead uh, with our academic session, I want everybody to honor our uh, Tamil Thai Parth song. And um, the audio is not here. Uh, ma'am, Alka, ma'am, uh, you need to enable the audio, ma'am. Chitraka, kindly help her. Uh, Alka, ma'am, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the audio is not coming, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can you please stop share once, ma'am? Okay. I will guide you, ma'am. Please stop share. One minute. Okay. Ah, uh, uh, please click on the share screen. In the bottom, there is an icon called share song. Okay. Uh, share song. Check Ah, uh, yes, 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 uh, yes. Click yes. that and then share, ma'am, so that you can, uh, we can hear the audio. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Now, ma'am. And before we move ahead, I request all our honorable dignitaries to digitalize uh, the lighting the Kutavalak. <laughs>
So moving ahead, I uh, we would be very honored to have Dr. Kundabi Madam to uh, say our Oxy prayer. Uh, she is uh, the Honorary Secretary of Oxy and she is the Head of Department and Senior Consultant and uh, in uh, Triple M Hospital. She has done her Diploma in Reproductive Medicine and she is a renowned uh, National Board Certified Obstetrician. She is a specialist in reproductive medicine and lab surgery for more than 20 years. Uh, she is a member of Fertility Preservation Committee member, an active member of OXY, OXY, IMA, ISAR, TAPISAR. She is also an endometriosis committee member, has fellowship program in Triple uh, M. Uh, she is an invited faculty in multiple conferences, has various publications to her name, and she is a chairperson for Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee. Uh, Unfortunately, we couldn't have our madam with us to, uh, today for the evening session. Uh, so I request Dr. Priya, ma'am, to say our Oxy prayer. Thank you. Thank you, God. In humility, we gather. In gratitude, we pray to all the good things you have given us. Show our hearts with your blessings to pass on the healing touch, to celebrate the arrival of each new life and the mom reborn. The courage to deal with it all when things are not perfect and to remember that we are but messengers to keep our women safe and free from sorrow. We bow before your kindness and the magnanimity of your endless love. Thank you so much, ma'am. So it's time we uh, honor our uh, very much lovable president of Oxy, Dr. K.S. Jairani Kamraj, ma'am. She is a senior consultant of reproductive medicine, a director of Akash Fertility Center and Hospital in Vadapalani, Chennai. She is a treasurer of Tapisar, an associate secretary, World Association for Sexual Health, advisory council member, World Association for Sexual Health. She is a yeah, yes, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am, for uh, being with us today. I request madam to uh, introduce our chief guest and guest of honor for tonight. Anivarukum uh, vanakkam. It gives me great pleasure and honor. And uh, it's a very great pride moment for Oxy23 to welcome the chief guest for this webinar, Professor Swarna Kadilkar, madam, who is a very dynamic, very lovable, and very much kind-hearted uh, Secretary General, Deputy Secretary General of Foxy 21-24. Madam is the Vice President of 22-24 and Secretary of MOCS between 21 and 22. Madam is the, uh, the Editor Emeritus of Journal of OBGYN Jogi 21 onwards. And she's the Editor-in-Chief for Jogi. And she's the Treasurer of Foxy between 2018 and 21. Madam was the President of Indian Menopause Society in 2017. And she is a recipient of 30 local, national, and international awards. and Jai Rani, 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 Jai yes, Rani, please. Please. <laughs> It's a great pleasure and honor for us to have you here, ma'am, for our Journal Club, Club. And I would like to get your words of wisdom, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, oh, one second. Thank you so much for inviting me here, Dr. Jairani. And I'm very sorry for uh, getting delayed in every uh, communication you had with me. Uh, but I was very eager to join this particular uh, webinar because the journal club and uh, everything about journal is very close to my heart as uh, I have been associated with our journal uh, of uh, Foxy's journal, that is Journal of OBGYN of India for last several, several years. So since almost 1998, uh, I'm, I have been associated with the journal and all uh, research that uh, we conduct is all uh, very close to my heart. I can see the wonderful work being done by Dr. Jairani. She just briefed me about uh, Oxy's uh, various ventures that she's doing. It's a fantastic work and I have to congratulate you, Jairani, for doing all so much of volumes of work under the flag of Oxy. And particularly today's program, I can see it is wonderfully organized and the topics that have been chosen are, uh, I think, research methodology module about medical writing. And uh, I uh, request all our uh, audience or all of our uh, who have members who are participating, if you are interested in uh, even learning 
uh, in detail about medical writing you can go to jogi's editorials that i have written uh, editorial series i have written on uh, medical writing so do log in and go online and see these editorials if you are interested and uh, all i think younger generation is also interested for doing research so it will tremendously help them and uh, i see that uh, the two topics that have been chosen for journal club aspirin versus placebo in pregnancies uh, and i think these two topics have always and these questions have always been uh, you know in my mind i always keep asking does really aspirin help and second is also very very important and whole uh, our obstetrics we have done thinking about whether push method is better or patwardhan method is better so i think the research that you have chosen i'm sure it must be of high quality and when you describe the research i'm sure everybody will come to know what is their experience the author's experience and we learn a lot from their experience and their conclusions so i uh, once again congratulate the whole team oxy i think dr kundavi she could not be there dr surekha who is our chairperson i'm so glad that my co uh, joint associate editor uh, sujata dalvi is here as a honorary secretary of emox but she is such a uh, great uh, editor we have been working together on the uh journal uh, of obgyn of india foxy i can see the expert speakers moderators they all are all learned and i'm sure this particular uh, deliberation is going to be of great help to all of you so i wish you all the best for this uh, particular program jairani and i'm sure you will have many more of these programs uh, and uh, i wish you all the luck thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you for your lovely words and definitely all the postgraduates all the junior consultants and all the people delegates who are logged in will be definitely taking your advice of looking into the editorials and the research things in the jogi and they will all be working hard towards getting a lot of research for our foxy which is a very much need for the hour because that is a idea behind starting this journal club and we really took your take your words and work forward for getting most researchers from every one who are here the youngsters who are logged in ma'am thank you so much for your words and we look definitely we will work for your vision definitely so sure. all the best all the best thank, thank you ma'am thank Bye -bye. you so much thank you for your words and Bye. i have the great pleasure and honor to welcome and introduce our guest of honor madam dr sujatha dalve madam is the uh, she is actually the secretary of emox and she is a joint associate editor of jogi and i know madam for more than 15 years to start with she has been a, a person who has done a lot of research methodology workshop with us in oxy when i was a secretary and the madam has done a very encouraging work to most of our oxy members which we are almost 100 people who are registered in that workshop and madam is so dynamic in all her work regarding the research and she is the present librarian of the mumbai obgyn society and she is the president of the mumbai menopause society and she is presently the honorary clinical associate of navrojee wadia maternity hospital and jagjivan ram hospital madam is well known for her softness for her very appreciable appreciating work for everybody and definitely we look forward you as an inspiration madam over to you ma'am for your kind words of uh, your uh, guest guest of honor talk ma'am ma'am unmute myself ma'am you are mute ma'am sujatha ma'am you have to unmute ma'am please unmute ma'am so you are muted ma'am Yeah. Yes. Now, yeah, ma'am. Now, now, see. Yeah, ma'am. Yes. I, I will yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Jayadani, for such kind introduction. At an outset, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Jayadani Kamraj, President of Obstetrics and Gynaecology Society of South India, for giving me an opportunity to be a guest of honor at this Journal Club, along with Foxy Clinical Research Committee, where Dr. Surekha Taide is a Uh, committee chairperson my first interaction came with jairani when i selected chennai as a uh, city to have a pixe program which is a research methodology program from the journal side 
and that was for the first time that i met dr jayrani and interacted with her and she has such a good practice and i'm sure she has so much of time that uh, she could spare that much time to have such scientific session i must congratulate you for sparing so much of time to have a scientific session journal club research programs are very useful it gives an opportunity for the researcher to find out what is new and whether one can implement this so far as a patient uh, cure is concerned or no and whether it will help so far as a patient's care is concerned or no at times we do have case report and case series where you can have something which is rare which also could be of quite significance and i'm sure today's journal club the topics that are selected are so relevant that those who have logged in it will help them to figure out what is the correct thing and what exactly is the right approach to a particular part of the program and whether that will be useful for them in a future endeavor so far as treatment is concerned i would like to wish jairani for her future endeavor in poxy and i would also like to wish best wishes for today's journal club program thank you so much jaira thank you ma'am thank you for your kind words and definitely we will definitely all the uh, participants here will be much benefited from jogi and they are looking forward of many of their research to be published and uh, we all young uh, we always uh, i mean guide this your guidance to the young practitioners it's a very important and then we are uh, uh, definitely we will look forward to work for this research in a better way thank you so much ma'am for joining with your precious time and encouraging us thank you ma'am so i have the great pleasure also to thank welcome and thank dr nikita who has been a very much energetic to uh, give all her uh, research methodology wow, wow, i mean her uh, talk in all the journal club uh, she is the regional director of the medical advisor of abort we welcome nikita and also i have a great pleasure to welcome dr shobhana priya who is the joint secretary of ima tambaram who is an expert here and also dr preeti agarwal who is the professor of shri ramchandra medical uh, i mean srmc and also i have the great pleasure and pride to welcome dr nandita thakur who is a senior consultant of the nandita's fertility center and all the uh, i mean uh, my committee members headed by dr priya kannapen and the moc dr alka nadar welcome you all and over to you priya and alka for uh, continuing your scientific sessions over to you priya thank you so much ma'am thank you so thank much thank you ma'am thank you thank you dr jinagi alka you can do ma'am shall we start with our scientific session then yeah uh, please please mm. so uh, we have uh, i i welcome dr nandita ma'am to be our chairperson for uh, the session for the evening and uh, the first session will be spoken by dr nikita prabhakar she is um, well known for her health research methodology course which she has done in st john's research institute bangalore she is currently working with abort and uh, she will be doing uh, the module 4 for us today and um, over to you dr nikita thank you dr alka for the introduction um, shall can i start sharing the screen yeah one yeah, yeah. yeah. now you can share this i hope my screen is <clears throat> sorry i hope my screen is visible yeah yeah nikita yes perfect so uh, a very good evening to one and all present it's my absolute pleasure to be here this evening uh, this is my fourth session that i'm taking in association with oxy and uh, i have to say that you have been a wonderful audience it's a very interactive session and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here thank you to dr jayarani thank you to dr priya kanan uh, kanapan and uh, all the organizing members of the oxy committee uh, thank you and without any further ado i'm going to take you through the fourth session which is a session on medical writing just to give you an overview of what i'll be talking about is um, in terms of medical writing just an introduction to medical writing what is the anatomy of a manuscript uh, what are the technological enablers <laughs> Sorry, uh, Chitra, can I just mute? Uh, unmute all the others except uh, Nikita. Perfect. I'll carry on. 
Right, moving on. Um, some, a little bit about the ethics and confidentiality in medical writing, how to find the appropriate journal, uh, responding reviewers, and of course, the art of better medical writing. Um, just to start with, why write in the first place, right? Why we, everybody here is a clinician, everybody is here is looking at becoming an obstetric surgeon or an infertility specialist. Why write in the first place? So first and foremost, uh, it is to broaden our own horizons. Um, advanced professionally, yes, because there is a saying, publish or perish, uh, which is a very big reality today. Um, so the more you publish, the more reputed or more uh, accolades you build to your own name. So you, be, you will be eligible for larger grants for bigger studies, uh, the more number of papers that you publish. Um, number three, you contribute to an institution. So if you are uh, belonging to an institute, the more papers you publish, the more value the program, the, the study, the OG program will have in the institution that you're from. You're contributing to the field, which I think is the most tremendous thing you could possibly do because any, anything that we have in medical science today is because of somebody else's research, right? So by adding incremental value to your existing therapy area, it would be something that you can do to contribute to the field uh, for future generations and future auditions to come. Uh, improving practice and of course the personal satisfaction and development that you yourself have uh, grown from one stage to another. So I hope these are all <laughs> inspirations to enable the PGs who have logged in to continue to write once you do graduate as well because not just publish or perish it is really very incremental to the field as well. So what are some of the excuses that we say there's no time where do I have the time to write or I don't know what the process is. I'm very unfamiliar about the whole process of writing. I don't know where to begin. Or maybe because of past papers having been rejected by journals, it could be a bad experience. So I would suggest have better planning strategies, which can help because right now we are living in a technological age and era where everything is made simplified, starting from literature search and submissions and reviewing of documents. Everything has been made a lot more simpler. So planning and strategies, can help. It's really not that complicated, like I said, because we live in a digital era. And uh, don't get, uh, what do I say, persistent pay, persistent space. Everybody gets rejected at some point or another. And they say failures are the stepping stones to success. So please do persist and uh, write more papers. So the essential parts of a, a manuscript would be the, the IMRAD format, which is introduction, methods, results, and discussion. The uh, essentially, you can have a title of your manuscript, a, a title of your scientific paper can be either to identify the article's uh, main issue. For example, are statins useful in patients with uh, advanced chronic kidney disease? Or it can begin with the article's subject matter itself, right into it, papillary thyroid microcarcinoma and active surveillance. Or it could be, um, it should be accurate, unambiguous, specific and when possible, complete. For example, this very long title here of a clinical trial where uh, exenatide once weekly plus uh, dapagliflozin once daily versus uh, the other regimen in patients with type 2 diabetes uh, controlled with metformin monotherapy, which is called the Duration 8 study, which is a 28-week multi-center double-blind phase 3 randomized control trial. So they have not left anything unambiguous. You have a doubt about what type of trial it is. Everything is mentioned right in the title or could even be as short as possible, obesity and the health of future generations. And lastly, it can be enticing and interesting wherein it makes people want to read further. For example, GLP-1 receptor agonists and SLG2 inhibitors, a couple at last. So any of these can essentially be an ideal, um, what do I say, way to title your article or manuscript. So what is the recommended order for writing an original manuscript? Your tables and figures go right on top, followed by the results, then the methods, introduction, discussion, abstract. You do find, I agree, there are a lot of um, journals where you don't find it necessarily in this order, but you also find 90% of the time, uh, most reputed journals do have it in the order. You will find right at the top, There'll be those small icons where tables and figures are mentioned when you have the full article, that is. Uh, and then you have the results and mentioned right at the top and then the abstract and then everything in detail is mentioned below. So this is the ideal format. 
Now, coming to tables and figures, they are the foundation of um, your story. So editors and reviewers and readers, more than anybody, may first look and maybe only look at your title, the abstract, and the tables and figures directly, right? So the figures and tables alone should stand alone and tell a complete story. The reader shouldn't have to go back to the main text. Just based on your tables and figures, you should be able to tell the complete story. So a few tips when it comes to tables and figures. Use fewer figures and tables needed to tell the story. Wherein, uh, let's say you have multiple variables and each have come up to a, a common result, right? You don't have to put up all the variables and all the tables, uh, you know, analysis in the form of a table. You can give one common table that gives you the entire picture, right? Because naturally, see, it's easier when, when you look at five tables as opposed to 20 tables. It's, it's a lot more neater and crisper. Number two, do not present the same data in a figure and a table. So if you figure, if you have a particular set of data represented in the figure format, use some other part of your study to be represented in the table. So that way, just by looking at figures and tables, almost everything is covered. Um, when you enter a table in your study, please uh, avoid using grid lines. Just these three horizontal lines, most appropriate. Kindly remove the grid lines because it looks very clustered. And also, one must men mention um, the reasonable amount of significant figures, wherein here it's written 45.076 plus or minus 5.032. So, uh, one or two points after the decibel should be sufficient. In most cases, it is just the whole figure plus or minus the um, amount, right? So a reasonable number of significant figures should be more than sufficient. And when you have a descriptive uh, characteristics in a study, you have to ensure to give units, right? Systolic blood pressure measured in so on and so forth. So it makes it more easy. It makes it more relevant and nobody has to go back to your entire paper to read, okay, what did the doctor measure it in? What was the unit they have taken? Is it kgs? It is, is it pounds? Uh, you know, what, what is it? So please ensure to mention the, mention the units in the tables. Figures. When it comes to figures, it should have a brief title, essential experimental details in both the x-axis, y-axis, definition of each of the symbols and bars and explanation of the panels and all statistical information like the test used and p-values all should be mentioned in the description below. Coming to the results, you should not organize the results section in the order in which you did the work. Rather, it should make a narrative uh, it should make the narrative a logical progression. I, this is the progression or the flow of your paper or your study. That should be how your results should be written, right? So participants, this is the description of the samples. We had excluded these kind of patients. These were lost to follow up. Finally, in the remaining patients, we uh, looked at this as a primary outcome. And then these are some of the tables and figures to, you know, complement whatever results you are talking about, right? So a few tips include only findings that flow from your method section. Be sure that data is in tables and whatever data you've entered in the tables should match with the text that you have mentioned in your article. And you should remain objective. Do not interpret or comment on the findings, right? You should remain objective. Results is not equivalent to raw data. So the results section should summarize what the data shows, wherein you point out simple relation. It looks, for example, you know, it appears that a more number of smokers were found to have, you know, uh, have developed the primary outcome of lung cancer. Like, just point out simple relationships. Describe the bigger picture trends. Cite figures, tables that present, represent the supporting data right? Um, avoid simply repeating numbers that are already available in tables and figures. Like I said, you're given the time to paint a big picture here. Utilize this, uh, what do I say, 30 second elevator pitch that you have to have the essential uh, data upon tables and figures. And at the same time, not having the same story repeated here and there, right? And most importantly, reserve the term significant only for things which are statistically significant. Now, what verb or tense to use uh, would be always 
use past tense for completed actions like we found that women women were more likely to or men smoked more cigarettes than the average reaction time was right and use present tense for assertions that continue to be true such as what the table shows or what you believe out of this study or whatever the data suggests so you can say figure one shows or the findings confirm or the data suggests we believe that this shows here you have to use the present tense oh. now um using the active voice would be preferable for example in this sentence the passive voice would be activation of calcium channels is induced by uh, depletion of endoplasmic reticulum calcium stores you should rather put it as the depleting calcium uh, from the endoplasmic reticulum activates calcium channels it's short it's crisp right great authors always say we and i for example uh, i'm sure you remember this uh, dr watson and crick right we learned it in biology in 8th standard uh, watson and crick celebrate 90 900 uh, 1953 paper on nature begins which is our dna uh, dna structure was described by watson and crick right so we wish to suggest a structure for the salt of deoxyribonucleic acid so it looks what do i say great authors use we and i it's more humbling now coming to methods the methods section should be written as a recipe for a study's design so that others can reproduce the same research right so it should talk about the study design about the enrollment about the variables that you are looking at the measurements data sources and the statistical analysis all of this should be contained in your met uh, methods section now <coughs> apologies now you have to see if your journal's authors instructions include specific reporting guidelines for particular study designs please ensure to look at that and um, there are these these are the uh, links that i have included to major biomedical reporting guidelines one is the equatornetwork.org and the nlm nih gov services this is uh, these are two uh websites where you can look at biomedical reporting guidelines right now um this is the a couple of um, what do i say research reporting guidelines and initiatives uh, there's a consort quorum prisma moose remark start strobe guidelines and uh, for all and uh, structured uh, to have a structured paper or a structured uh, rct or structured systematic uh, meta analysis or systematic review these are a couple of guidelines that i put up here with as examples right um this is the equator network that i had put up the uh, link for earlier wherein the reporting guidelines for main uh, study types such as randomized control trials whether you're doing an observational study systematic review case report whatever type of study you're doing all of the various uh, respective guidelines like for example consort for your rct or strobe guidelines for observational study they are all uh, there are links that are present here so you would be able to go through these individual guidelines when you are uh, doing your study now uh make life more easy for your reader yes please use uh, flow diagrams or tables to simplify explanation or methods because as you know the method section essentially is a long portion in the uh, entire manuscript right so as much as possible if you can simplify it in the form of a flow chart or a table you'll find so many beautiful papers where the do doctor has explained the enrollment in a flow chart right or they talk about their um um an inclusion and exclusion criteria in a simple table so these sort of make it a lot easier for the reader think about it you are also doing literature research right how easy you would feel or how nice you feel when you look at a very organized paper right and also uh, report method methods in past tense okay because you this is something that you have already completed the action is done we measured this so and so so it should be in the past tense but use present tense to describe how data are presented in the paper meaning data are summarized as means plus or minus standard deviation so on and so forth right excuse me now coming to the introduction this introduction should include a concise review of relevant literature right um you should why provide context and rational as 
as to why you need the study. Why did you even undertake the study, right? What is the problem that you are addressing in this study? Then what is already known? So what is the knowledge gap that exists? And how will this contribute to this knowledge gap? And include a statement of purpose, usually at the end of this uh, introduction section, or even a hypothesis if it's appropriate. A few tips when it comes to introduction, be concise, but do not underestimate what has already been published. Be focused, keep focused too. It's, it's very easy to get carried away when you're, you know, it's like blowing your own trumpet, right? The reason we did this study is this and that. And just to let you know, this is the knowledge gap that we were trying to. So kind of don't get carried away. Keep focused to your subject matter and know your purpose stated clearly. This should be your introduction section, right? So what do you do? You provide context and rationale. You state what is already known and include statement of purpose. And please ensure to uh, quote relevant literature. So uh, essentially, when you do uh, an introduction, this should be the order. What is known? What is unknown? And what is your hypothesis or purpose? Right? So it should be literally like a funnel. You're zeroing in on the problem. So it'll be background information. What is the knowledge gap? What is your hypothesis? And finally, right, plan of attack. What is your approach? What is your plan of attack? Or what is your proposed solution? That is the way to write a beautiful introduction. Then comes the discussion. This is the most difficult section to write because it requires the author to interpret, but not over interpret his or her results, right? So what do you do in the discussion? Number one is you summarize all the main findings. Then you talk about the significance, what new knowledge is contributed and how does this compare with what has already been done before, right? That is a discussion section. Then you talk about the limitations of the study. You talk about future research directions. If you've seen many RCTs, no, uh, it'll be written. Some of the limitations of the study are uh, so and so. We were not able to include these particular category of patients. We, however, feel that when future research papers should be conducted to, um, you know, explore this area of interest also, or this particular uh, section or segment of the society also needs to be included and further research papers need to be done to establish the causal relationship between so and so. So if you notice, it will be written towards the end of the discussion. So future research directions also need to be given. And finally, conclusion. Now, when it comes, the a few tips would be read similar articles in your target journals for examples of how they have uh, put the discussion pointers together, right? So it gives you some kind of um, flow to write the discussion. So when it comes to introduction, it was an inverted cone. Discussion will be the same code, uh, cone upright, right? So answer whatever question you have asked, support your conclusion, your data and others' data, defend the conclusion, and finally give the bigger picture or the take-home message of your study. Right. So it's essentially the inversion of the introduction cone. Then the abstract, the abstract is a mirror of the full manuscript. It is a highly condensed version of your complete paper, commonly about 250 words or so. Structure is organized. It's organized by headings. Unstructured is one single paragraph. I'm sure in your literature search, you would have come across both types of abstracts, right? Structure, structured, wherein they say background method or uh, objective methods uh, results conclusion and then there are other abstract you just see it's one entire paragraph where they start off saying we find that um you know oxytocin is very effective in postpartum hemorrhage but we wanted to compare it blah 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 it just goes on as a story right those are the unstructured formats of writing an abstract now a few tips when it comes to writing the abstract use words that will help in electronic searching Right. Because remember, we are in a digital platform. Now, no, there are no more. There are. But nobody goes through the big fat journals in the libraries anymore, unfortunately. Uh, so use, um, what do I say, <laughs> words that will enable people to find your article more easily. Right. Uh, some authors write the abstract first because it helps them organize their thoughts. It's completely up to you as well. And of course, always double check before submitting. So a few technological en enablers include. So for the outline, headings, subheadings, and topics, you have some uh, 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 an app by 
Thomson Reuters called EndNote. This is really helpful. And uh, Zotero. Zotero is also a free tool that helps you to organize, to cite, and to say, share your research structures. These are a few technological enablers to help you with your outline, to help you with your uh, bibliography, right? And uh, also to keep an organized library because it keeps all the papers that you're doing for literature search also in the library section. So you're able to quickly take it out and then cite them. So these are a few technological enablers to make our life uh, a lot more easier than it already is. Plan effectively for original research paper. Yes. So number one is the first session that we took. Have a clear research question. Now, I'm so tempted to put the question out here to ask if anybody remembers the structure of the research question that we had done in our very first session a few months ago. There are five parts. I'm not able to see the chat box, but if anybody remembers, please enter it in the chat box and you'll make me a very happy person today. <laughs> the five parts of a structured research question. Great. Then number two is seek statistical advice. Use the right study design again. We've divide. We had studied uh, different types of study designs as well. Um, act ethically, of course. That goes without saying. Keep an open mind and minimize bias, and agree to publish even negative results. This I feel is extremely important because you might go in with a certain mindset, intending to prove you know A equals B. Sometimes you might get A equals D. Please don't be you know, averse to publishing it because a negative result or a positive result, a result is a result. All your hard work has brought this into fruition. So always, always publish. Behave ethically. I, I'm, <laughs> I don't have to say this, but uh, as per the Declaration of Helsinki, ICH, GCP guidelines, we do have good clinical practice guidelines. There are courses and certifications to get this GCP uh, uh, certifications for ethical research. And um, publication ethics, of course, avoid misconduct, don't fudge any data, um, protect the patient's identities, informed consent has to be taken. So um, no deviation from that risk imposed on participants. Let's say you're giving some sort of a trial drug, um, always the risk has to be clearly informed to the participants, benefits to the society, benefits to participants, everything has to be reported very clearly in your publication. And it's not always enough to state that the study was approved by an ethics or committee or IRB, right? You should also feel um, ethically cleared in your mind as well. Protect patient's confidentiality, like age, sex, location, um, clinical details, test results, uh, unusual personal story or context, photos, or even if a, a body part or clinical image, as much as possible, uh, patient confidentiality has to be protected. Um, see, even in um, pharmacovigilance, right? Whenever a drug, adverse drug reaction is um, uh, reported and that goes into the national database and then from the national database, it goes into the global uh, database called Vigibase, wherein all of the adverse drug reactions to a particular drug are uh, measured and stored in this particular um, online um, library. Even there, none of the patient's uh, ex explicit details are shared. That is how much you ought to maintain confidentiality, right? Because big data or data is something that has become very precious right now. And um, it's also a reason to get litigated or it's a reason to get sued. So please ensure to protect patients' confidentiality. So for clear writing, Make sure to keep it simple. Use short, familiar words. No need to use the thesaurus and come up with excessive amount of complicated language. Avoid jargons or acronyms. Be specific, concrete, not abstract. And say what you mean and mean what you say. Uh, there is an application called Authenticate. I'm sure there are other uh, applications as well. This is a way to prevent plagiarism in published works. Um, you, I'm pretty sure a lot of colleges have subscriptions to um, these uh, authenticate and other anti-plagiarism sites because even the guides themselves put the paper through this uh, website to see if there's any part that has been plagiarized. Uh, so please ensure to put your put your works through any kind of a platform to prevent plagiarism and also follow the protocol to prevent plagiarism in the first place. Right? Some ways to prevent plagiarisms. Of course, make sure to cite appropriately every quotation, every 
a word that you take from your research paper has to be cited or quoted, right? So in conclusion, planning is key. Extensive amount of literature review while you have done it. Quotations are important. As you keep um, also reading a lot of papers, it makes you familiar with the entire process. So it helps you develop an expertise. So I would always recommend extensive amount of literature research and literature review before even starting a research, right? Because first of all, it will expand your knowledge as to what is already existent in the market. What is a knowledge gap? What is a knowledge gap where you can actually address or add incremental value? And what is plausible? What is not plausible? And beyond all that, the underlying message will be you will be more and more familiar with works of others and it gives you a structure as to how you can go about to do your own research paper, right? So like I said, learn how others have done it, identify the gaps. And yes, to quote Mr. Th um, Dr. Thomas Rosenthal, the research starts with a review, advances to a study and expands to a publication. And again, to quote um, uh, Professor Cliff T Tabin from Harvard, uh, I never think what's needed to get published. I think what's needed to do good science. So if you focus on answering interesting questions, the papers will take care of themselves. Then begin thinking of manuscripts at the time of grant development. Start thinking about authorship. The need section of a grant can be the basis for the introduction of a manuscript. Because like we said, in the introduction, you're talking about the knowledge gap. You're talking about what is already there. And then you're talking about what you are bringing into the picture, right? And publishing a literature review in advance can help you get that grant. Finally, don't give up. Never get discouraged with feedback from colleagues and journal editors. Writing is something we all need to constantly work on. Perseverance is key. Thank you and a very good day to one and all present. I hope my presentation was clear. Yes, Dr. Nikita, that was definitely a 100% uh, amazing presentation. And uh, for people like us uh, who are in a medical college and on an every day-to-day -day basis, we think uh, how to write a research. I think you have done a fantastic job in uh, clearing all our uh, doubts and helping us to come with a good research uh, article. Thank you so much. I Thank request uh, our chairperson, Dr. Nandita, ma'am, to give her expert comments on Dr. Nikita's presentation. Uh, Nikita, that uh, congratulations. That was an excellent presentation. And I think everybody who is writing papers will be very much, you know, taking home points. I took my own points from your talk. So we hope to hear more of uh, this so that it will help all of us, right? So being teachers, we are also learning a lot more. Thank you very much. So uh, moving on to our um, actual journal club uh, session uh, for this uh, July 2023. Um, let me just share my screen. So I would like to have on board our expert advisor, uh, Dr. Shobna Ma'am. She is our associate professor in Bharat Medical College and Hospital. She is a UG and PG teacher, a joint secretary of IMA Tambaram. She is a very active member of Clinical Research Committee, FOXI 2022 to 2024. Founder of member Kanchpura Moji Society, best service provider in PPICD insertion in Chengalpet. Doctor's Day Special Appreciation Award by Chengalpet Medical College and Hospital, Best Doctor in Chengalpet by District Collector 2023. Area of interest is high-risk obstetrics. I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, I would also like to uh, welcome our uh, moderator for today's journal club session, Dr. Preet Ma'am. She is our professor and senior consultant in OBGYN Srihar. She is a lecturer um, uh, in OBGYN at TN Medical College, Mumbai in the year 1999 to 2000, a registrar in OBGYN uh, in Australia, as well as in Auckland Hospital, New Zealand in 2004-2005. Then she joined Ram Chandra as an assistant professor in 2005-10, to 10, then became an associate professor 2010 to 2022. Alka, Alka, we can start. Yeah. Yes, 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 ma'am. So our first topic will be uh, by our very lovely senior resident, Dr. Niveda Arunachalam. She is an MBBS and uh, MS uh, OG DNB. 
she has done her MBBS in Chetinad Hospital, and she is a uh, she has done her post graduation in Ramchandra, and now she is working as an SR with us. Uh, we are happy to have Dr. Nubeda to present the first uh, topic for our journal club: uh, aspirin versus placebo in pregnancies at high risk for preterm preeclampsia. Over to you, Dr. Nubeda. Niveda, you can share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Is my screen visible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, ma'am. So, good evening to one and all present here. So, today I'm going to uh, talk on the aspirate trial. Aspirin versus placebo in pregnancies at high risk for preterm preeclampsia. So this trial, it was published in 2017 by New England Journal of Medicine. So preeclampsia is an important cause of maternal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. So the risk of such complications is considerably higher when the disease is severe and of early onset, leading to the preterm birth at less than 37 weeks of gestation. So hence our major challenge here in modern obstetrics are the identification of the women at a high risk for preterm preeclampsia early in the pregnancy and the interventions to reduce the prevalence of the disease. So here the aspirin, was found to reduce the incidence of preeclampsia with a dosage of 50 to 150 mg per day, varying benefit uh, depending on the gestational age at which started. So the ASPRAY study is the biggest randomized double-blind multicenter research trial. Here, it was done in the first stage of the study the women were screened for the risk of preeclampsia using a combined preeclampsia screening protocol in the first trimester around 11 to 13 weeks based on the biophysical biochemical parameters. In the second stage, the women in the high risk group were given 150 mg aspirin or placebo from 11 to 14 weeks till 36 weeks. And the outcome study was delivery of preterm preeclampsia of less than 37 weeks. So the trial design and participants, it is a double blind placebo controlled trial with the duration from April 2014 to April 2016. And the trial was conducted in 13 maternity hospitals in UK, Spain, Italy, Belgium, Greece and Israel. So 26,941 women underwent screening with singleton pregnancies for preeclampsia from 11 weeks to 13 plus 6. Here the women at high risk were given aspirin of dosage 150 mg per day from 11 to 14 weeks till 36 weeks. The primary outcome studied here was delivery before 37 weeks with preeclampsia and the secondary outcome studied were the any adverse outcomes of the pregnancy before 34 weeks of gestation, before 37 weeks of gestation and uh, at or after 37 weeks of gestation, stillbirth, neonatal death, neonatal therapy and poor fetal growth. So 26,941 women with singleton pregnancies were screened. So these were the, um, this was the risk model, the screening criteria. So this new algorithm included maternal characteristics such as age of more than 35, Afro-Caribbean race, a chronic hypertensive, SLE, APLA, prayer history of preeclampsias, family history, weight of more than 69 kg, type 1 or type 2 diabetic. The biophysical parameters included mean arterial pressure and uterine artery pulsatility index. And the biochemical parameters included PAP-A and PGF, which is placental growth factor. The inclusion criteria for the study were age of 18 or more, 
singleton pregnancies, live fetus at the time of scan at 11 to 13 weeks, high risk, which is of more than 1 is to 100 for preterm preeclampsia, according to the screening algorithm. And the exclusion criteria was the patient was unconscious, severely ill status, learning difficulties, mental illness, any major fetal anomalies at 11 to 13 weeks of ultrasound, if the patient is already on regular treatment with aspirin, if she has any history of bleeding disorder, peptic ulcer, hypersensitivity to aspirin, long-term use of an NSAID, or she's already participating in another drug trial. So here, a total of 26,941 women were screened for preterm preeclampsia, so out of which 2,971 were at high risk for preterm preeclampsia. Out of 2,971, 332 were excluded as they did not fit under uh, as they did not fit under the inclusion and they were falling in the exclusion criteria. So total of 2,641 were eligible for inclusion and out of which 865 participants declined. So a total of 1,776 underwent randomization out of which 878 were assigned to receive aspirin and 898 were assigned to receive placebo. In the aspirin group, 78 withdrew consent and two were lost to follow up. And out of which 798 were included in the primary analysis. And uh, among the placebo group, out of 898, 74 withdrew consent and two were lost to follow up. So 822 were included in the primary analysis. So um, this is the adverse events and adherence. They were assessed and recorded at the follow-up clinical visits at 19 to 24 weeks of gestation, 32 to 34 weeks of gestation, and 36 weeks of gestation. And three telephone interviews were made, which occurred at 16 weeks, 28 weeks of gestation and 30 days after the last tablet was uh, taken. So here the participants were encouraged to record any side effects or adverse events in a diary that was reviewed at each trial visit. And they were specifically asked about such events during each telephone interview. And uh, also the adherence was assessed by counting the tablets that were returned by participants at each visit and by the participants reporting of the tablet counts during each telephone interview. So coming to the statistical analysis, the sample size estimation was based on the assumption that the first trimester screening would detect 76% of the cases of preterm preeclampsia. The hypothesis here is low dose aspirin would result in a rate of preterm preeclampsia that was 50% lower than the rate with the placebo. And 1,600 participants would give the trial 90% power to show a treatment effect at a two-sided alpha level of 5%, which was increased to 2,776 for attrition. The statistical analysis was done on intention to treat basis. The logistic regression analysis used to determine significance of intergroup difference in incidence of preterm preeclampsia. The treatment effect was quantified using odds ratio with 95 and 99% confidence interval for primary and secondary outcomes. And statistical software package R was used for the data analysis. So these were the characteristics studied in the trial participants the gestational age of among the two groups, uh, the gestational age of 12 weeks, age 31 years, BMI around 26, race, the method of conception, diabetes, nulliparis, smoking, preeclampsia in the mother, chronic hypertensive, SLE, APLA, multiparis with or without a history of preeclampsia, no significant difference in aspirin and placebo groups in terms of the prevalence among these characteristics, and the risk of preterm preeclampsia at screening was around 2.3%. So as I said, these were the characteristics of the trial participants studied in both the groups. And moving on to the primary outcome, 
So here the definition of preeclampsia according to International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy, where the systolic blood pressure of more than 140 millimeters of mercury and diastolic blood pressure of more than 90 millimeters of mercury on at least two occasions, four hours apart after 20 weeks of gestation in a previously normotensive women with a proteinuria of 300 mg or more in 24 hours or the urine protein creatinine ratio of 30 mg per millimole or more or two readings of two plus on the dipstick. So the primary outcome study was the preterm preeclampsia occurred in 13 of 798 participants in the aspirin group and 35 of 822 participants in the placebo group. And also for preeclampsia in less than 34 weeks, it occurred three of 798 in aspirin group and 15 of 822 in a placebo group. So these were the outcomes of the trial. As I said, the primary and the secondary, and these were the neonatal outcomes according to the trial group. These were the following studied, stillbirth, death or complications, requirement for the therapy, uh, poor fetal growth, without without the preeclampsia, without without being SGA, uh, neonatal bleeding, miscarriage, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, anemia, sepsis, RDS, NEC, ICU care, ventilation, and IUGA. Adverse events, there were no significant difference in adverse event in both the group. So the conclusions of the ASPRAY trial were in women identified by the first trimester combined screening to be at high risk for a preterm preeclampsia, the administration of aspirin at a dose of 150 mg per day from 11 to 14 weeks till 36 weeks significantly reduces the incidence of preterm preeclampsia and there is no significant difference in neonatal outcome or adverse effect of the aspirin. So moving on to preeclampsia, it complicates 2 to 8% of the pregnancies. The definition according to ACOG 2013, where we have a systolic BP of more than 140 and a diastolic of more than 90 on two occasions, four hours apart, after 20 weeks in a previously normotensive patient or of systolic blood pressure of 160 and a diastolic of 140, sorry, 110, with a confirmation within minutes is sufficient. Along with this, the other factors would be a proteinuria of more than 300 mg in 24 hours or a protein creatinine ratio of more than 0.3 mg or a dipstick of more than 1 plus. New onset hypertension with any of the following with or without the proteinuria will all also be diagnosed as preeclampsia, such as a platelet count of less than 1 lakh per ml, creatinine of more than 1.1 mg per deciliter or doubling in the absence of renal disease, liver transaminases twice of the upper limit, associated pulmonary edema and cerebral or visual symptoms. This is a pharmacology of aspirin. So aspirin is a prototype of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug and a member of the family of salicylates that have in common salicylic acid as an active agent. Salicylic acid is composed of a benzene ring and two radicals, one hydroxyl and one carboxyl. In the acetyl salicylic acid or aspirin, the hydroxyl group Salicylate, salicylate is transformed into an acetyl group by esterification. So this is the mechanism of action by which it blocks the cyclooxygenase enzyme. The doses below 300 mg selectively and irreversibly inactivates the cyclo cyclooxygenase 1 enzyme suppressing the production of prostaglandins and thromboxin A2, which is mainly the reason for vasoconstriction and platelet aggregation, thereby inhibiting the inflammation and platelet aggregation. So these are few studies on which shows the benefits of aspirin, which when initiated less than 16 weeks is much more higher. 
So the role on aspirin dose on prevention of preeclampsia and FGR, here it, in, it uh, involves a study of 45 RCTs, uh, including a total of 20,000 pregnant women randomized between 50 to 150 mg of aspirin. And it concludes by saying a low dose aspirin, if initiated of more than 16 weeks gestation, has no impact on the risk of preeclampsia, a severe preeclampsia or FGR, which in turn says us that the benefits of aspirin are only increased when it is initiated less than 16 weeks and also the risk reduction is greater with a higher dose of aspirin. This is another paper, the chrono uh, chronotherapy with a low dose aspirin for prevention of complication in pregnancy, which was published in 2012. Here, it is a prospective randomized double-blinded placebo con uh, controlled clinical trial. And uh, the results which showed was uh, ingestion of a low-dose aspirin should start less than 16 weeks. And also, it is better advised to be ingested at bedtime, but not upon awakening. Why so? Is because the acetyl salicylic acid when ingested at bedtime as compared with upon awakening, it significantly diminished not only the 24 hour level of uh, plasma and renin activity, but also the excretion of the 24 hour urine sample of cortisol, dopamine, and norepinephrine. So, this concluded that the decreased activity of these pressure systems constitutes a biologically plausible explanation for the finding that ASA ingested at bedtime reduces the BP whereas ingested in the morning does not. And uh, this is also another study, competing risk models uh, in early screening for preeclampsia, which uh, suggested the detection rate of preterm preeclampsia is 95% when all the maternal characteristic biochemical and biophysical parameters are included. So these are the society guidelines uh, on the use of aspirin for PE. According to ACOG 2016, consider the uh, use of low-dose aspirin, which is 81 according to ACOG, initiated between uh, 12 and 28 weeks of gestation for the prevention of preeclampsia based on risk factors. According to ACOG, they took the risk factors of history of preeclampsia, multifetal gestation, chronic hypertensive, diabetes, renal disease, and autoimmune diseases. According to SOGC, the dose was 75 to 162 mg per day, should be given at bedtime for high risk, such as chronic medical history, personal family history, or abnormal uterine artery Doppler before. According to NICE, low-dose aspirin 75 mg was given, should be given to women at risk for preeclampsia from 12 weeks till birth. Their high risk factors, according to NICE, included hypertensive disease in precious pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, type 1 type 2 diabetic, chronic hypertensive, SLE or APLA, and the moderate risk factors included First pregnancy, age more than 40 years, pregnancy interval more than 10 years, BMI of more than 35, family history and multiple pregnancy. And according to WHO, it also suggested 75 mg in, uh, for the prevention of preeclampsia and high, uh, uh, at high risk of developing the condition to be initiated before 20 weeks. So here the summary is the first trial to screen. This is a first trial to screen women for preeclampsia based on combined screening of demographics, biophysical and biochemical characteristics and evaluating the benefit of aspirin in such women. A dose of 150 mg used, which is higher than the usual recommended dose, which is based on the meta-analysis showing more risk reduction. And it is uh, also started between 11 to 14 weeks gestation, which shows maximum benefit. So this aspirate trial is a definitive proof, enabling us a new strategy for screening, which has been shown to be superior to the other currently used methods. The earlier we detect the risk of a preeclampsia, the more effectively we can treat it with something as simple as aspirin. Thank you. Thank you, Niveda, for a very elaborative session on aspirate trial. I'm sure everybody who was listening to your uh, uh, presentation would have been convinced that how various bodies had suggested various doses of aspirin and how now uh, there is a standard dose that is recommended according to the aspirate trial. Thank you so much, uh, Niveda. Uh, uh, Dr. Nandita, ma'am, would you like to uh, comment on her uh, journal 
topic i think we've all been using aspirin for the last uh, you know decade or two decades uh, for uh, pre eclampsia we're just trying to hit at the right dose 75 became there were studies with 81 and uh, yes. now it's moved on to 150 we're taking a double dose yes. and we've seen over papers if you have gone through the papers which i did a few uh, paper thing the number that we see which actually go into the pre eclampsia is decreasing with the increasing dose so maybe it's 150 today maybe 5 years down the line we might see another number come up but i think it is very very useful especially to you know when you combine all factors PLGF yes. I've been doing for a long time and it's found to be very effective when you add that as a parameter and you give aspirin definitely the incidence is very uh, much lower yes ma'am okay very true uh, it was a good paper a very well uh, got through thank you thank you so much ma'am for your expert comments uh, dr shobhna ma'am would you like to comment on the the paper presented by dr nibeda yes ma'am as we follow uh, the uh, uh, we now take the pro protocol study of this paper and then we give aspirin but the thing is then we have i don't know how much of us we follow the combined screening and then we start the aspirin as study suggested we have to start screening but because i uh, we i have not started doing the combined screening and then to start maybe i will just have an uh, baseline criteria and then start the aspirin so we should uh, now can start on with combined screening and then if possible giving an aspirin at that dose and uh, definitely everyone would have started the aspirin uh, much ahead of the uh, around the 11 to 13 plus 6 of the 90 scan level and definitely it gives an positive uh, positive outcome madam yes very true ma'am even uh, in our institute we have not yet made mandatory that everybody should go through that uh, pre eclampsia biochemical screening uh, though the risk factors are there uh, we clinically assess the patient and then we just we start the aspirin uh, i totally agree with you madam uh, any other comments from any other uh, uh, dr preet ma'am would you like to say something I think our uh, Preet Ma'am has uh, gone for an emergency. May I will go ahead with the next topic, Madam? Is it okay? Yes. Yes, I. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, our next topic for. Uh, today evening will be presented by dr abhimati she is one of our uh, senior post graduate in uh, obgyn she has done her mbbs from uh, kpv government medical college trichy and her internship from mahatma gandhi memorial government hospital trichy she is currently our post graduate and uh, she has presented uh, various paper and posters in various conferences uh, her topic for today will be comparison of push method versus patwardhan method Uh, on maternal and perinatal outcome over to you dr abhimati abhimati you have to unmute yourself abhimati we cannot hear you are you talking Uh, ma'am there might be some headset problem so can you remove the headset
Archu. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Ma Good evening, everyone. My topic of presentation will be comparison of push method with Patwardhan's method on maternal and perinatal outcomes in women undergoing cesarean section in second stage. Uh, it, is, was, it was conducted in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology in Jipmer, Puducherry, India, and it was published in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, March 2019. Background, the cesarean section in second stage is often associated with the deeply impacted head, and hence various techniques have been described to overcome this difficulty to deliver the fetal head during a second stage cesarean section. The commonly used methods will be push method, the pull method or the reverse breech extraction, the Patwardhan's method and the fetal disimpaction system or the fetal pillow. A small demonstration of the techniques. In the push method, the assistant pushes the fetal head by gently cupping it and then flexing and pushing the head which causes disimpaction and further delivery is done similar to a routine cesarean section. Care should be taken not to uh, directly uh, uh, injure these skull bones. The next technique is the Patwardhan's method. Here, the uterine incision is placed at the level of the anterior shoulder in a deeply impacted head, which is first delivered. Applying gentle traction on the shoulder, the other shoulder is also delivered. And uh, with the help of assistant giving a fundal pressure, the operator by hooking and giving gentle traction on the, both the axilla delivers the body of the fetus, which will be followed by the delivery of the feet and the head is delivered by traction on the legs. And this will be the fetal pillow method. Here, the base of the plate is folded to squeeze the doom of the balloon. And the doom of the balloon is placed in contact with the fetal head. And the blaze plate is at the pelvic floor. And the patient's legs must be placed flat before inflation. And this fetal pillow is inflated with 60 cc of normal saline and can be inflated up to 180 cc and the valve is closed and this causes disimpaction of the fetal head and the routine cesarean section is performed and uh, during removal the valve is opened and it is deflated and the uh, uh, device is removed by hooking a finger on the plate and pulling it outside through the vagina. So the objective of the study to compare the rates of maternal and neonatal morbidity of delivering the fetal head using either the push or the Patwardhan's method in women undergoing cesarean section in the second stage. This is a retrospective uh, cohort study which was conducted in the Jipmer Institute and the period of study was from January 2014 to 2016 and all pregnant women who underwent cesarean section at full dilatation with their fetal head or zero station or below, and where the fetal delivery of the fetal head was performed using the push or the Patwadhan's method were included. An exclusion criteria includes women with multiple pregnancies and fetus in a non-vertex presentation. The case records were retrieved and data was collected regarding the maternal characteristics such as age, height, weight, BMI, and obstetric details such as parity, gestational age at delivery, and me medical comorbidities. And these are the baseline characteristics which were compared between the push method and the Patwardhan's method. Uh, so totally, there were uh, 33,106 deliveries out of which 6,105 were cesarean deliveries and emergency cesarean section accounted for 4,734 out of which second stage cesarean section was 321 
and after exclusion criteria, the number of uh, samples included was 298. The indications of caesarean se section, the perioperative details such as the type of anesthesia, the experience of the surgeon, duration of surgery, and the method of delivery of the fetal head, and neonatal details such as NICU admission, neonatal sepsis, birth weight, and other neonatal complications were also noted. The intraoperative and postoperative complications until discharge from hospital were also retrieved. And outcomes were compared with respect to the technique used for fetal head delivery, either by the push method, which was allotted in group A, or Patwadan's method, which was allotted in group B. The primary outcome was the extent of the uterine incision involving the lower segment uterine vessels or the broad ligament and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Uh, that is babies with Abgar score at five minutes was less than seven. Early neonatal death that is within for seven days of birth and neonatal sepsis diagnosed in the presence of two or more tests positive in the sepsis screen. And secondary outcomes included the postpartum hemorrhage, bleeding of more than 1000 ml, and intraoperative trauma to the bladder or bubble, an additional procedure to control PPH, which did not respond to medical measures, and it included uh, uterine artery ligation, internal iliac artery ligation, B lynch compression suture, or peripartum hysterectomy, and sepsis, which was defined as fever of more than 100.4. Statistical analysis. The data were analyzed using the Stata 13.1 software and a p-value of less than 0.05 was considered significant. The results out of 298 deliveries, 221 fetuses were delivered by the push method and 77 by the Patwadan method. Both methods of delivering the fetal head had similar rate of extension of the uterine incision. Uh, the extension to uterine, flap uterine artery, broad ligament and vagina occurred similarly. And other complications such as uh, postpartum hemorrhage, injury to the bubble and the bladder, and the need for uh, blood transfusion were also similar. But surgical site infection was higher in those who delivered by the Patwadan's method, and 12 uh, needed re-suturing of the wound. Uh, this shows an uh, increase in incidence of surgical site infection in uh, patients who are operated using Patwadan's method with a significant p-value of 0.012. One maternal death occurred in uh, group B due to refractory pulmonary edema in a patient who underwent cesarean section for intrapartum eclampsia. This was unrelated to the uh, procedure. And another patient presented with urinary incontinence and was diagnosed with vasegovaginal fistula at two months postnatal. Uh, she had undergone a cesarean section in view of CPD and delivering a baby by push method. There were five intrapartum stillbirth and six neonatal death. The neonatal deaths were secondary to sepsis in three cases and uh, due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in two cases and meconium aspiration in one case. The rate of distribution of neonatal death were almost similar in both the groups. And there was uh, two cases of subgallial hemorrhage in push method and one in case of Patwadan's method. And there were six cases of laceration over the forehead in push method and one in case of Patwadan method. And uh, there were fracture of rib and fracture of humerus in a uh, Patwadan's group. The rate of NICU admission and neonatal sepsis were higher in those babies delivered by the Patwadan method. So the rate of NICU admissions and neonatal sepsis and birth weight, these are all the significant things which was more in case of the Patwadan's method. The discussion, the stretching and thinning of the lower uterine segment, which is noted in cesarean section, predisposes to the increase in uterine incision extension. The difficulty in fetal delivery increases the risk of neonatal morbidity and mortality. Uh, in the study, the birth weight was lower and the incidence of the neonatal sepsis was higher in those babies which were born by the Patwadan's method, which could have attributed to increase in the NICU admissions. And two babies were diagnosed with the fracture following Patwadan's method, suggesting the difficulty of the technique. The limitations of this study, this being a retrospective study, uh, there, is a, there was an unequal allocation in both the groups and the decision to use which method was based on the clinical grounds at the time of surgery, taking into account the station of the fetal head and the experience of the surgeon. And there was no documentation on the duration of rupture of membranes, which could have contributed to neonatal sepsis. Conclusion. The use of either the conventional push method or the Patwadan's method led to similar rates of uterine extension 
and other maternal morbidities such as postpartum hemorrhage, sepsis, and need for uh, blood transfusion were similar in both methods. And admission to NICU and neonatal sepsis were significantly higher in case of Patwadhan technique. Uh, further, a prospective RCT uh, with uh, equal allocation in both the groups uh, comparing the methods of delivery of the fetal head is required to provide evidence on the safety and benefits so as to enable its use in the second stage section. This is my parent article. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Abhimati, for a very wonderful uh, journal presentation. Uh, I would request Dr. Nandita, ma'am, to give her expert comments. Uh, I think uh, this is a need for all the obstetricians. We have come a long way. It's gone a full circle, but further modified, but further push technique, then we use the balloon. So every time, you know, we get stuck in a procedure, we try the other procedure. But the morbidity is much, much higher. We should realize that. Okay, because the thinner the segment, more the trauma, more the hemorrhage. So uh, in Patwadhan's uh, technique, if the shoulder of the baby or the position of the baby in rotation, if it's just facing downwards, the occiput right up, probably it could be much easier without damaging the fetal parts. But in, uh, if it's in a rotated position, definitely the trauma is going to be high because we are trying to manipulate both the arms, bring it out like a cross on both sides, then deliver the body of the thing. The reverse patwadan, yes, delivering with a breech probably will add much less trauma that was not included in the study. The ratio of the number of patients also in this particular study was half. So obviously we are seeing more number of sepsis. That's what even the conclusion line says. So I think it's a very, very good article for an obstetrician because every second counts at the time of delivery. We want a good upguard for the baby. The time to deliver also is longer because we're doing more maneuvers on the baby. So I think it was an extremely well-chosen article for discussion today. Uh, and she did a very good job. Anybody else can add a point too? Yeah. Dr. Shobna, ma'am, your expert uh, opinion, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That... Uh... I here they have taken uh, the uh, in, in in this retrospective study they have the Patwadhan method was used in almost twenty five percentage and uh, yeah push method in seventy four percentage but so we do not know and obviously the complication neonatal complications are high in Patwadhan but I have a doubt here like uh, how they are expert in their own technique matters to the delivery of the baby, which has caused the uh, neonatal injuries and then the neonatal admission. Of course, sepsis is there uh, here in the Patwardhan because I follow Patwardhan rather than push mother because I have been trained in Patwardhan. Similarly, how the surgeon is getting trained and how it is causing, the, because I have, uh, uh, I was there 10 years in government and uh, I have never used uh, push method to be very frank but none of my babies have gone for an um, I think probably uh, less than uh, uh, for five or five babies would have gone for an ad admission in a Patwardhan baby because it is the expertise of the surgeon and the assistance to deliver the baby is also much more important in the Patwardhan mm. uh, of course push also requires an assistant but uh, it is the experience of uh, the expertise of the surgeon also matters then and uh, we have to go for as uh, the uh, in this presidential ship we are going for the optimizing cesarean section rate we need to also uh, go uh, as in the study we started they told that uh, because of the litigations and because of the young generation as we are you know, not confident enough to use the mid captive forces we are going for a uh, cesarean section so we have to reduce the section rate as well and uh, we, uh, we get stuck in the second stage we should be enough handling the uh, delivery of the baby in a better way so that would be, it's a good study, but it depends also on the expertise of this uh, surgeon in which technique she is trained at. Very true, ma'am. Very true. Uh, that is a very good uh, point uh, that all the uh, obstetricians here who are attending has to understand that the, the technique that she has shown as a video, it looks very simple. But as the Nandita ma'am also said, if the back of the baby is not anterior and it's probably like posterior, 
it is very difficult to get that shoulder out and cross on either side. So uh, not patwardhan might not be the solution for every second stage C-section. So that is one point which has to be very clear. But everybody should know how to deliver via patwardhan as well as breech extraction. That's very important because push method might not always be very helpful and might not always work. So you should be well versed with other techniques as well. Yes, ma'am. Preet, ma'am, would you like to say something? Yes, thanks, Alka, for conducting so well. Thanks, Oxy, for giving us the opportunity. Nivedita, Nivedita did a very good job of detail. As we all know, the aspartile, but still there was something which aspiration, aspirin, how it works and how it does the job. So Nivedita told in a very good way. And second stage section has always been a nightmare. Even after doing so many thousands of section also, when we are left alone at night, the second stage section is always a nightmare. So we thought that this topic will be very useful for all the young people hearing it and know all the different techniques of delivering the head. So I think both of them did a good job. Plus the our chief guest and everybody also told a very good thing, comments. Dr. Priya, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I think madam is not there, but uh, this is the end of our session of Journal Club July 2023 by Oxy. And uh, may I uh, thank Oxy uh, from the bottom of my heart and as well as from the whole team of Ram Chandra to give us an opportunity to present the Journal Club topics for July month 2023. Um, I thank uh, Dr. Jairani ma'am to give us this opportunity. I thank Dr. Nandita ma'am uh, for being the chairperson for uh, today's session. I thank Dr. Shobna ma'am as well for uh, her expert comments on both the topics. I thank our chief guest, our uh, guest of honor uh, and everybody, all the participants who are present here for uh, tonight's uh, session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Breet ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. In spite of your duty, you did it. Okay. <laughs> yes. yes. Thank you, ma'am.